Okay, so uh, lecture, this last lecture today. Now, first of all, wow, I get to go and follow those two lectures. <laughs> they were fantastic. So I want to thank Patrick and Brenda both for a wonderful start to the day. So I'm, I guess I'm batting cleanup. <laughs> Pretty tough job after those two, but we'll see how it goes. Um, one thing I want to just mention to you real quickly is yesterday a patient of mine showed me a website called The Brain Health Magazine. They just released their first electronic journal and guess what the title of the first journal is? The Vision Issue. Amazing, huh? They're talking about brain injury and the very first issue is about vision. I think that's pretty, pretty supportive of us. Unfortunately, I didn't see any ODs in there. We've got chiropractors and other people, which is great, but if you just take a look at that, you can go to the website. You can get a free subscription that's in digital format. If you want to get it in paper, you can go ahead and access that and pay for it that way. All right, a disclosure statement. I have nothing uh, to disclose. What? Kickstarter. Kickstarter project, she did have that, yeah. <clears throat> now, back in 92, Journal of AOA had an article by Cohen called Optometry, the Invisible Member of the Rehabilitation Team. I want us to think about that. Is the optometrist still an invisible member or are we now in the team? I think we're in the team, but we need to still continue doing several things. One is, our group, have we taken some of our core concepts and taken them to and, and expanded upon them? For instance, like post-trauma vision syndrome. One of the main diagnoses or symptoms of this is exophoria and exotropia. How about another thought? There was a recent paper in the Journal of Optometry that showed a high prevalence of esophoria, not just exotropia. So what I'm gonna suggest is we are almost at our 30th year already. In two years, we'll be at 30 years. I think that we should reflect back on all the things we've done and gained but at the same time, I'd like to see us kind of revamp things and look at it from a little different perspective, too. So it's a really, really important part. Now, uh, there's going to be just a couple small touchy things about scope of practice we're going to talk about, but I want you to think about one thing. Every patient should be provided the very best level of care possible. We should be thinking about our patient exclusively. We should freely be referring patients out. I myself, I'll tell you, uh, the nutrition lecture was awesome yesterday. I wish I understood as much as I should, but that's an area of growth that I need to make. But there is nutritional people in my area that I can refer to. I'd rather do that and do a really much better job at what I do. So again, these are some of the things we want to think about. So this morning we had Patrick talking about accurate diagnosis, optimum prognosis. We had Brenda talk. One of the things that we've been talking about is that 95% of the vestibular issues are central issues. Central means it's in the brain processing it. Only 5% are peripheral vestibular issues, which means it's in the otoliths or the semicircular canals. So when someone says, this patient has a vestibular issue, what do we usually do as optometrists? We think, oh my gosh, vestibular, I'm the eye doctor, I don't want to do anything with vestibular because it's not important. But 95% of all vestibular issues have a visual component. Therefore, we are really front and center for them. One of our biggest tools is lenses. Lenses impact the vestibular system in a huge way. So that's what we're going to be looking at, some of those factors today. She also talked about the eyes or the liars. Well, it's because the visual system adapts to different conditions. It can sometimes make things worse off because we're trying to work better. Now, my, my big push today is gonna to be talking about optometry is critical within the team and making it more visible. And it's simply, it's not just rehab. We know that there is a large area of rehabilitation activities we do. And we sit side by side in my hospitals that I work at with the OTs and PTs and we set up protocols for them to work with because there's no way I can be in the hospital seven days a week. They have to be there supplying the care. But I'm there basically providing the initial evaluation, the management, and the diagnosis for these patients so they can get the best care possible. 
Now, what are, are we really providing the best optometric care we can? I think about this myself every day in that I see a patient and now I have a new challenge and I'm trying to find new ways. Think about uh, years ago here at uh, Nora, we had Ramachandran talk about phantom limb. Now, what happened since then? Now we have a discussion about tinnitus and that that may actually be like a phantom limb aspect. Now the thing that I've been seeing recently, and Ken Kafrida has been writing about it a lot, is visual snow. Maybe visual snow is actually one of these types of situations where we have a phantom visual problem, and that's visual snow. How many of you see visual snow patients? Raise your hand. These are tough ones, aren't they? But we, I really want to investigate that more because I think that we can come up with maybe some ideas on how to treat these patients. Ken Kafri and some of the group in the New York area are working on this presently. So again, I think that the level of care we can continue to improve and that's what our goal should be day in and day out. Second thing is do we provide clear and appropriate clinical information to those in need, to our colleagues? Here we have been emphasizing what? The continued improvement of optimistic care and understanding a lot of what other people do, like osteopathy and those types of things, which is great. But the, really the thing that I want to see from an optometric perspective is I want to be able to see optometrists provide a better, higher level of care. I want to see more optometrists in the rehab facilities. Um, I myself, I go in one day a week, and to me, that builds my practice. My practice, I've never had a problem with patients. We're booked out more than two months right now because the physiatrists know who I am and many times with care these days in the hospital setting the patients are in there for one or two weeks and then they get discharged. So I might get a referral on Monday, I go in on Friday and they're already discharged. But those patients are already set up to do what? To come back and get an evaluation for me. So again, that's a, another thing to think about. So we're going to look at, as far as optometric care, the first part is a comprehensive vision evaluation, including ocular health, and looking at multiple different tools that we have to provide the best treatment options. What are those tools we have? Our toolbox, we have lenses, prism, selective occlusion, and tints and filters. Those are the four tools that we want to look at evaluation and determine which of those four is going to be the best tool for us with each of our patients. In addition to that, we're going to look at neurooptic rehabilitation, NOR. So let's take a look. A nice quote here from Deanne Fitzgerald. She says, I cannot imagine evaluating or managing an ABI patient without a vision exam. I concur with that 100%. Because if all I do is I do a, a Brock string or a near point of convergence activity, that doesn't give me any information regarding a lot of areas. It gives me one little insight into one aspect. And what I want to do is I want to be able to get as much as I can and knowledge about that patient so that make sure that they can get the care. Now, how do we provide better care? Appropriate knowledge and terminology to aid in patient education and communication to our colleagues and other providers. So for an example, when we're actually saying we're doing vision therapy, I would say we're doing visual vestibular therapy. We cannot separate vision from vestibular. How many of your patients move their head in therapy? All the time. I can only think of one instrument, the amblyoscope or synoptophore, that you put the patient's head into a unit and you put them in and lock them in position and have their eyes move separately. Everything else includes eye movements and head movements both. So we're always actually using vestibular input. We mentioned already the post-trauma vision syndrome, that there's also a high prevalence of esophoria with concussions. So that kind of says, you know, we've got to relook at that maybe. How about the term visual midline shift syndrome? Maybe we should readdress that, and some people have started this a little bit, because visual midline shift means it's a visual midline shift. It's, a, it's shifted visually. So is that just optics? Can we affect it with vestibular input? Can we affect it with cervical input? Can we affect it with auditory input? Certainly we can, and we'll show you some demonstrations of that today. On regards to the patient, you have a patient with a field loss. Well, is it a true field loss, or is it an attentional issue in that field, or perhaps even a combination of the two? We need to be able to work with our patients and help them understand that. 
with other providers. We want to make sure everybody understands that a screening for something is not the equivalent to an examination. A examination includes a full ocular health examination. Optometrists now. Also, we could be talking to our colleagues talking about single vision versus bifocals. One of the things I've been seeing a lot in my office are patients who have been put into monovision or um, an intraocular lens bifocal, and then they have a stroke. It's like tough. That's a tough case. The only reason that people can do well with monovision and some of these progressive types of issues is that we have enough resilience in our body to deal with it and go back and forth and be able to manage our visual world. When we bring these other factors into play and someone has a stroke, they lose that resilience of it and now we have lots of symptomology showing up. So I think that's important for us to continue talking about. There's some articles and such that are out there supporting that.